morning. Good morning. Good morning. Before I start, I'd like to have a children's story. Before we start with the children's story, I was wondering if you guys would like to give us an offering again like you did last week. They're going to come around. If you have three dollar bills, give it to them and then just bring them and put them right up here in the uh, baskets in the front and then I'll tell you a story. Yes, play some good new music. That would be very nice. <laughs> watch what you say. 
Because where we live now, they don't have what we call religious liberty. They're not free there to openly speak about Jesus. Now see, we take that for granted. And we take it for granted so much that a lot of times we don't even speak about Jesus. But when Bob went to this country, he started to realize just how lucky he was that no matter where he was at, he knew that every Saturday he could go to church, he could worship Jesus. When he moved to this new country, they didn't even have a church. And so they met at his house. The father had found some people that believed like they did. But they had to have a very small worship service inside the house. They couldn't speak loud. They couldn't sing loud because you had to watch what you say. And you didn't know if the neighbors were listening. Would you like to live in a place like that? No. Would it be fun to live in a place like that? Listen, Jesus calls us to be witnesses for him wherever we're at. And Bob knew that. Even at his young age, he loved Jesus. And he loved to talk about him because, see, Jesus did a lot for him during his whole life. When he needed something, he would pray, and Jesus would answer his prayers. He saw how Jesus helped his family when they needed it. But when he moved to this place, things had changed. But he still loved Jesus, and whenever he got the chance, he would tell his friends about Jesus. And some of his friends got to know Jesus as their friend as well. But listen, I tell you all of this, the entire church. We have this thing called Religious Liberty Sabbath, and this year in the church, the General, or the Florida Conference, had some problems with the timing, the mailing, the brochures, and the printing. So everything went pretty much south. So next week, we're going to take a special Religious Liberty offering and if you enjoy your religious liberties, then I pray that you will be generous in your giving. Do you guys get allowance? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. oh, man. Well, listen. You don't get allowance? I think you need to have a powwow. Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so listen. So if you can bring something. You remember this money that you collected here? You guys can bring something for this offering that we collect next week and you show the adults that even you guys can give it'll help them to give as well. But listen, what Religious Liberty does here in Central Florida is that the offering that is collected, the money that is used, will be used to give Religious Liberty magazines to thought leaders in our community. That would be lawyers, uh, doctors, anybody in business. So Religious Liberty Magazine deals with issues directly relating to your religious liberty. Now we take it for granted that most of us, because we're settled in our jobs, we really don't have any problems with religious liberty. But I can tell you when I first became an Adventist, the job that I had, you had to work on Saturday and Sunday. I worked at a golf course and it was mandatory. And I thought I wasn't working anymore. They said, well, We'll work out a deal, and I worked what I was supposed to do Saturday and Friday before it got dark. But that lasted for about six months, and then I got fired. And I got fired right when my wife was supposed to bring home our brand new baby. So we got a brand new baby and no job and a brand new house. Okay, so I know religious liberty, how important it is, and I also know that being an Adventist, you will run into problems if you work in the secular world. How many of you guys in here work for the post office? Raise your hand. You want to know why? <laughs> okay. How many of you guys work at a bank that's open on Saturday? So there are issues that we deal with, and we have freedoms in this country. You're allowed to speak of Jesus. You're allowed to be able to work and go to church according to how your conscience dictates, that will only last as long as people like you, people like you, will stand up for that freedom. So listen, as you grow, remember how important it is to be able to freely talk about Jesus. 
And remember next week, if you can bring a dime, bring a dime. If you can bring a penny, bring a penny. If you can bring a quarter, bring a quarter. Bring a piece of paper. There you go. Let's go ahead and have a prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity to have this children's story. I pray that you continue to bless these children here, bless their parents, and bless all those in this church who are here this morning. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> of Jesus Christ. This morning, I'd like to look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And let's start by looking at Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Jesus comes on the scene, and before Jesus started his ministry, you had his forerunner, and that was who? John the Baptist. Okay? At this time, it tells us in verse 14, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the what? What's that word gospel mean? Believe in the good news. Now, turn with me, and we're going to go through a lot of scriptures this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and let's look at verses 1 through 11. I want you to see the life of Jesus. He comes on the scene, he starts preaching the gospel and telling the people to repent and believe. But before Jesus does all this, there's something that takes place, and that is that he's baptized and the Spirit falls upon him and it leads him out into the wilderness. And I want you to see what your Savior had to go through to prepare him for this ministry, to prepare him for this good news. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Yes. Tempted by who? Yes. And when he had fasted, how many days? Forty days. Fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what's out in the desert? Nothing. Okay? So when it says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, where did he get his water from? It wasn't like he could go to the 7-Eleven and, and get just a piece of bread, right? Now, if I don't eat in six to eight hours after I wake up in the morning, I get really, really grouchy. <laughs> and, I mean, I can go a whole day without eating, done it, many times I can go two days done that, but you don't want to be around because if I don't eat, I get grouchy. Can you imagine going 40 days and 40 nights fasting? Not fasting in the comfort of your own home, but fasting in the desert. Now, who was out there with him? Just the wild beast. Okay? That would be like dropping you off in the middle, in the middle of the uh, Ocala National Forest for 40 days and 40 nights. And there's bears out there and other animals, and leaving you there to fast. And if you thought that was bad, who was tempting him? See, the bears and the other animals are easy. It's the devil that you've got to watch out for. So for 40 days and 40 nights, he's tempted in the desert. Let's continue to read on. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, I love that, afterward he was what? Hungry. Yeah, you think? <laughs> really? 
Now when the tempter came to him, now listen, did the tempter come on the first day? No. On the 20th day? No. After 40 days. After 40 days, when he was hungry, then the tempter comes to him, right? In his weakest moment. Why do you think he had to fast 40 days and 40 nights? What was the purpose for that? Moses had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus was our example. When the devil came to him, and we'll get into that, what was the first temptation? There is a spiritual connection between what he did here and what took place at the very beginning. You understand what that connection is? Where was it that Adam and Eve fell? Okay, now it wasn't because Adam and Eve fasted 40 days that they were hungry that they fell. They fell because they wanted something they weren't supposed to have. But it was still appetite. Right? Amen. Now, how many of us, we come to church, we read our Bibles to strengthen the spiritual man, and the devil comes and tempts us and we fall after we've strengthened ourselves. And yet Jesus was in the desert for 40 days, and then the devil comes to him. After all of this fasting in his weakest, and yet he still doesn't fall. Why is that? He's clear-minded. Because he never lost his connection with his father. Yeah. The lack of food didn't change who he was in his father. Now see, you can say who he was in Christ. Okay? True. <laughs> didn't change who he was in his father. Is that right? Yeah. So it wasn't the lack of food. Wasn't going to weaken his spirit. He was, for lack of a better term, Jesus was converted, Amen. right? He was a born-again believer, and nothing was going to change that, right? Because he continued to walk with his Father. Now you see, we are able to continuously walk with Christ. And when the tempter comes, we don't have to fail either because we are a child of God and we are in Christ. So let's continue to read on. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If, if, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, What? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, there you go, the same word, what? If. Yeah. If. Now listen, because the devil thought in this weakened state that he could get him to doubt. And that's all that it would take is just the small seed of doubt. Right? Right? If he wasn't walking in the Spirit, he would have fell. That, that's, that's the key there. He said, the flesh is weak, the Spirit is willing. He, he was fully about the Spirit. You ever wonder why he went back to Scripture? Why didn't he just say, I'm the Son of God. Get out of here. Right? And Jesus was tempted, and he went out into the flesh, or went out into the wilderness, did he go in his divinity or in his humanity? Amen. Was it his divinity that kept him from falling? No. no. You need to understand that. That when the tempter came, he tempted him in his humanity, and Jesus did not use his divinity to overcome. This is why he is our elder brother. This is why he is our father, and this is why he is our savior. Amen. Because he took this and he overcame with this because of his connection with his father Amen. now listen Jesus right here in this part of his life 
gave you the example of righteousness by faith. He did not rely on his power, but what did he say? It is written. And he had faith in that word. So then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, If, if you are the Son of God, do what? Throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. Lest you dash your foot against a rock. Now, the devil's a sly one, isn't he? Like Jesus had eaten in 40 days, 40 nights. He's hungry, and the devil comes to him with food. Just turn these stones into bread. Now, did the devil believe that Jesus could actually turn those stones into bread? Yes. Yeah. He knew he could. He knew who he was, and he knew his power. So listen, Jesus counteracts that with the Word of God. So the next temptation comes... And the devil tries to tempt him by misquoting the word of God. See how the devil works there? See this back and forth. The devil is brilliant. But you gotta, you gotta be stupid. How, how could you possibly think you're going to overcome God? But Jesus took on human flesh, and he already succeeded with Adam and Eve and all of their offspring to that point. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And he thought there was a chance with Jesus in his humanity. The devil understood the parameters of this battle. He understood the parameters of Christ. That when he took on humanity, he took on humanity. Amen. <coughs> Think about it. If there was no way for Jesus to fall, why would he waste his time tempting him? Amen. Right? Amen. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and did what? Showed him all the kingdoms. Because this is what this is about. This is about worship. The devil wants to be worshipped like God. He wants to have a throne like God. And if Jesus would just bow down to him, then he would be like God. But if Jesus bowed down to him, then Jesus would not be able to be your perfect substitute. Right? So what the devil is saying is, listen, you don't have to go through all this. You don't have to do the cross. I'll give all this to you. And all these kingdoms will be yours. Bow down to me. And Jesus said, no. There's no place for the two of us. There can only be one of us. Right? Jesus wasn't willing for you to ever be under the control of Satan. And so he told him. When Satan showed him all these kingdoms and said, I'll give all these to you, what did Jesus say? <laughs> Jesus said then, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. <laughs> then the devil did what? The devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So turn now to chapter 13. No. Chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 18. It's one chapter over. So Jesus is victorious in the wilderness. He starts his ministry. And in the Gospel of Matthew, he gives the Sermon on the Mount. One of the greatest sermons in the entire Bible. Okay? And here in chapter 5, verse 13... He tells the people, and he's speaking now to me and you, and he says that we are what? The salt of the earth. But he tells us, look, if the salt loses its flavor, then how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Verse 14. Verse 13 says you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14 says you are what? The light of the world. I thought Jesus was the light of the world. How are we the light of the world? Jesus. 
There you go. Because Jesus lives in us, he will shine through us. We are the light of the world. We are lights and salts. We season this world with our presence because he lives in us. And so when the world sees us, they should see him. Amen? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled upon by men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? And glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do what? For surely I say to you that till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until what? All, All is fulfilled. Turn over one more chapter to chapter 6. Let's look at verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures where? On, earth. On this earth, because moth and rust will destroy them, and thieves will come in and steal them. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your heart, or for where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be also. There will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is at. Where is your treasure? Is it just amassing more things that this world has to give? Or is your treasure in heaven? Okay? Now we live here, right? And you'll have a life here, but this shouldn't be the focus. And it shouldn't be where you spend all of your energy. Because you're salt and you're light. And if you're not working for the kingdom of God, you need to figure out where your heart is. All right, a couple more. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13. It says, Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors, they're nice people, aren't they? <laughs> You throw a party, that's who you want to come to your house. Let's invite everybody that works for the IRS, right? Especially if you work in your own business, right? <laughs> I get an extension every year. So, you know, taxes are due April 15th, right? I get an extension until November. And I usually don't file them until November. So, you know... Um, I just paid the year before's taxes, and now this year's taxes are due, and I won't pay them until November, and then by that time, the next year's tax, you know what I'm saying? So it's just it's a vicious cycle. So do you really want a bunch of tax collectors at your house? So listen, Jesus saw Matthew at his tax collecting table, and Jesus said to him, follow me. And what did Matthew do? All right.